Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm pastor and teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue our study in the book of Psalms. We'll be studying Psalm 75. Now, before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins. At the same time, we are allowing His Spirit to control us. Let's pray. I have any Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and all that you have provided so we can study your word today. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 75 is another short psalm. Let me just begin with the introduction. This is a declarative praise psalm. Now let's talk about what a declarative praise psalm is. These psalms begin with praise. Then the psalmist will tell what God has done or is doing or the cause for praise, followed by another call for praise. Now, this psalm is also, Psalm 75, also appears to be in the subcategory of a communal thanksgiving psalm. These would be sung uh in during liturgical activity that means during their worship services so and perhaps doing some sort of sacrifice or offering so here's what i'm saying <clears throat> though it's a declarative praise psalm that's the general pattern okay you can't be precise on all these patterns because there's exceptions this is one of those this one actually begins more i think with thanksgiving and there's a reason because this is one they might use during a uh, a service of fellowship, of thanksgiving. So it has some variations to it, but at the same time, it's still only like 10 verses long. Well, let's look at the message. <clears throat> Aware that God will judge at his appointed time, the psalmist warns the boastful wicked that judgment is coming from the only one who can deliver and truly exalt. So this says a couple of things. The psalmist is going to teach that God is the judge and he'll judge at the appointed time, his set time, and he decides to. He'll judge the boastful wicked. At the same time, it's the same God, of course there's only one God, who delivers and exalts the righteous. Okay, that's what this is basically saying. The outline as a representative of the people, Asaph gives thanks to God for his wondrous works and says that he, of course that's God, will judge fairly at the appointed time. That's verses 1 through 3. Roman number 2, Asaph warns the boastful wicked that judgment is coming from God who also exalts. So he puts those in kind of the same thought area. You know, he's going to judge you. But he also exalts those who are righteous. So you can see right there these people have made a choice, or they can make a choice. Three, the psalmist declares forever, praising God who cuts off the wicked and lifts up the righteous. That's the last two verses, 9 and 10. Well, let's begin. The superscription, that's 75, 0. To the director of music, according to Do Not Destroy, a psalm of Asaph, a song. A little tricky here trying to figure out what's it mean according to Do Not Destroy. Well, scholars don't know for sure, but they're probably pretty close. They have two or three ideas we can talk about them. Uh, it could be a way of saying that we're going to sing it to this tune, to the tune of that song called Do Not Destroy. You ever sang a song? To a familiar tune of another song okay well that's the idea uh, it could be the first line in the in the uh, idea of that song that they're imitating here or sh should, should i say using called to not destroy oh you know the you know the song to not destroy well we're going to sing the song according to that tune all right some think it may be a strange name and i'd say it's a strange name for a musical instrument or some sort of style of music. We've seen it three times before, Psalm 57, 58, and 59, 
Now we have it in Psalm 75. Anyway, it's a psalm of Asaph. <clears throat> Remember, he's one of the choir directors. And it's a song, something to be sung. So, we come to our first section. Let me read that over one more time. I'll put it on the board for you. We really do want to learn this. Let's understand what's going on. And let me tell you something. When we read this at the end, you'll probably understand it a whole lot better. All right. Part 1, Roman number 1. As a representative of the people, Asaph gives thanks to God for his wondrous works and says that he will judge fairly at the appointed time. So it begins. Remember I told you it started with thanksgiving? Look at this. He begins with thanks. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous works. This says several things. Let's see. First of all, he uses the word we give thanks. He says it twice. So it's for emphasis. When you say something twice, isn't it for emphasis? Well, that's true here too. Then they say, for your name is near. Now, what does that mean? Well, the last line gives us a big clue. We recount your wondrous works. Isn't it true that when you remember what somebody did for you, you also remember them? Sure you do. And that's what's going on here. For your name is near. We recount or we remember your wondrous works, your miraculous like your wonderful works. So God's nearness is seen when they remember his wondrous works and tell others about him. Just think of all the things that God has done for Israel, delivered them from uh, the plagues, delivered them from Egypt, opened up the sea so they could walk through on dry uh, uh, land, <clears throat> delivered them in the desert over and over again. And then we just think of all the battles that somebody like David had and all the victories he had. So lots of deliverances. So they can recall some of those great victories. You know, when they walked across their land, they could say, well, we know there was this battle here, son. Let me tell you about it. And God delivered us. Let me tell you what God did. So you see, one of the things you want to learn, in addition to what we're seeing here in the psalmist, it's a good thing to share what you know that God has done for you. It's a testimony of how great God is, of his wonderful works that he's done for you. You know, sometimes when I get over sickness really bad, I'm so thankful. Because sickness at my age especially, I'm so tired, I'm so worn out. I can just get a cough and it can wear me out. So I'm tired. I'm thinking, why am I? Oh yeah, I've been coughing all day. No wonder. Okay, so you're always thankful when God delivers you or heals you or does something great for you. And when you talk about it, think about it, it's like God is close to you. It's like you're almost reliving that time. In verse 2, we have God speaking. So the psalmist has God speaking in his psalm. He would be like representing. He'd write down what God would say or what God was wanting him to say. So God speaks. Listen to this. When I appoint a set time, I will judge fairly. Now, that's the principle. What's the principle? God will judge at a certain time. And he will judge fairly. That means with justice, with uprightness. Now, this could be both present tense, or I should say, or future tense. God's always going to be fair in his judgments, whether it's right now or in the future. But that's the point we want to see here. God always judges fairly with justice. And you remember that. He's not going to let anybody get away with anything. They will get their judgment. <clears throat> okay, that sin must be judged. If they're not a Christian they will suffer judgment for rejection of Christ. And that's a very severe judgment. So see, Christ paid for people's sins. But at the same time, while we're still here on earth, when people do things wrong to people, if they don't make it right, God can judge them here on earth. Okay? If you reject Christ, you're eternally judged. If you're a bad person here on this earth, you can be judged on the earth 
And if you're an unbeliever, you rejected Christ, you can be judged for all eternity. You see? Well, the point is, God is the judge, and he has a time where he'll do it. Sometimes it'll seem like, well, God, why do you let them get away with so much? Won't you judge them now? And it'll seem so slow. Or you do something wrong, and right away it seems like you're getting disciplined. Why are you so fast on that? <laughs> what you got to remember is that God is always perfect in his timing. Don't forget that. In addition to being fair, he's, his timing is perfect. Vengeance will come to the bad guy. Vindication will come to the good guy, the one who's obedient. He is the only one who can judge perfectly at the right time. Verse 3. When the earth and all who inhabit it are unsteady, it is I who keep steady its pillars. Selah. Now this is like God is speaking. When the earth and all who inhabit it are unsteady. That's, just picture it this way. Let's say the earth was a big round ball. We know it's round, right? And say it's stuck on some pillars to kind of hold it up in the air. All right. You've seen some of those globes uh, where they spin around and they have a big stand. They're great big old globes, right? And what if it had a bad leg on it and it kind of shook every time you roll, it, roll the globe around? Well, that's kind of the picture we're seeing here. People on the earth... The earth itself is unsteady, okay? Kind of sways back and forth and it's not supposed to. God says, it is I who keep steady its pillars. I hold it still. I don't let it shake like it's not supposed to. Now, why would it shake? Because what we've seen in this verse, wicked people, evil people, are out to destroy the morality of what God has given to people to live by. So we say from the scripture and also from morality, do not steal. They say, well, it's okay to steal. Do not murder. No, you can kill whoever you want. Do not lie. I'm going to lie what I want to, right? That destroys the morality. If that gets big enough and loud enough, You've got a real problem, and that shakes things up. Why doesn't that happen all the time? Because of the second line. It is I, God, who keeps steady its pillars. I keep it from getting, we might put it this way, shook to death or shook apart. Yeah, you'll have those people, but they don't control everything. That's not the world rule for people to be totally immoral all the time. You see, the thing is, if you let people just run wild and do whatever they want, oh, we're free, we're free to sin, we're free to steal, we're free to lie, they're going to destroy their very society. Immorality destroys, well, we might say the very fabric of civilization. It's like ripping it apart, eating away the stability. It's like you got real bad termites in the legs of that stand that holds the globe up. And it's made of wood, of course. And it's starting to totter. It's starting to fall. Okay? Remember this. God is viewed here as keeping the world from shaking apart by keeping its pillars steady. Now, the idea of steady, by the way, it means like regulate it, to control it. Do you ever think what would happen if God was not holding the earth together? As it says here, it'd be chaos everywhere. Total chaos. So God, in a sense, shores up the earth by keeping the moral order within certain boundaries. It doesn't let it get too far out of hand. And through judgment and blessing. What does he do? He will bless the moral nations, make them strong, and those moral nations will judge the evil nations. Now, the evil nations may get away with a lot first. And God can even use evil nations to judge some good nations, but that's because he has a special purpose like he did Israel. 
But generally speaking, good moral nations are stronger. They know we got to defend ourselves from evil. They know that people are basically evil, and they need to protect their families, themselves, and their country, their freedoms. Well, this is what God does through principles of morality that he gives the human race. This is a way in which he keeps steady its pillars. Now we come to the next section where Asaph, <clears throat> let's get our section head up there. Asaph warns the boastful wicked that judgment is coming from God who exalts. So we're saying two things here. God judges and God exalts. In verse 4, it's unclear whether God or the psalmist is speaking. Either way, the truth still holds, okay? So it could be the psalmist just representing God or God kind of like saying, okay, I'm going to say this. It's, it's kind of hard to sort that out sometime. But the point is, as you will see <clears throat> clearly when we get through it, I said to the boastful, do not boast. I said to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Now, see, either psalmist or God could be saying that in the psalm, okay? But this has a double warning. Notice, do not boast. Do not lift up the horn. When we get done with that, you'll see how it's a double warning. But it's a stern warning to those who are arrogant. It's also to the wicked. So you have the wicked, arrogant, boastful people here. Do not lift up the horn. Let's talk about that for a moment. What's the horn? The horn represented strength. If you ever looked at an ox, I suppose you have, you notice they're big old horns. You ever watched a, a, a bull and his horns? Boy, you want to stay out of the way of those, right? Well, the horn would be the horn of the ox here, and it's used as a figure of speech for military strength. Listen to some verses on this. This is interesting. They're one from, let's see, one's from Samuel, 1 Samuel 2.10. The other two are from the Psalms. 1 Samuel 2.10, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. The anointed is the king. He exalts the horn, his strength, his power. Psalm 89.17, for you are the glory of their strength. By your favor our horn is exalted. Psalm 92.10, but you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. Notice we even have the word wild ox in here, so the horn is clearly related to the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. It's like they've got refreshed, okay? So here's the idea. The wicked boaster lifts up his horn. That's a way of saying he's got some sort of victory. He's got some sort of power. Verse 5, the warning continues. Do not lift up your horn on high or speak with a haughty neck. So this just kind of expands on what we saw in verse 4. Now the horn is being lifted up high. What would that be for? Why would they lift a, high, a horn up high? You ever seen anybody shake their fists in the sky and say, God, I hate you. Something like that, terrible. Well, this is defiance. So they might lift up the horn on high to show they're defiant against God. Or speak with a haughty neck. What a, what's a haughty neck? You probably don't know what that is, but that's a neck that kind of sticks out and high. You ever seen anybody do that? Well, you're not going to tell me anything. And they have their chin up in the air. Okay. Did you know a a, uh, uh, some animals will do that. Uh, they'll hold up their head. I guess it's to show how tall they are, how strong they are, or they're just telling that other animal, you better not come near me. So that's the idea. It kind of goes along with the horn here. All right? So you have them lifting it on high, probably against God. That's why they say on high against heaven. 
And remember, the horn represents the power of some animals, like the ox. It's the ox's proud moment. He will lift up his head, showing his confidence and superiority over his adversary, whether it's another animal or another man, or a man, I should say. You see? Listen to some more verses. We have lots of verses on this type of thing. I'll read them a little fast. Deuteronomy 33, 17. A firstborn bull, he has majesty, and his horns are the horns of a wild ox. And them he shall gore, with them he shall gore the peoples, all of them to the ends of the earth. That's his power, you see. They are the tens, ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. That's a couple of tribes in Israel. The main thing I want you to see here is the wild ox and the bull and the horns. First Kings 22, 11. And Zedekiah, son of Kenanah, made for himself horns of iron and said, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall push the Syrians until they are destroyed. So the horns here representing power or military strength. Last one, Psalm 92, 10. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over my fresh oil. I think that's all from the ESV version. I didn't put it down there at the bottom. So what we have here is this warning. Do not boast. Do not lift up the horn. Don't lift it on high or speak with a haughty neck. All warnings against someone being arrogant and boastful. Let's talk about that type of person for a moment. Arrogant people, proud people who like to boast, and they really don't have anything to boast about. Uh, it's not all about them. Life is not about them, but that's how they view it. Everyone should look at me, what I do, what I think, what I say. I'm most important. Everybody's life should uh, revolve around me. I'm like the most important ar person around. These people... Now we're talking about mostly adults here, but it happens to kids too. They act totally independent of God. They don't need God, you see. That's the way they act. Or that they'll never be accountable. They'll never have to answer to God. Or that there's any kind of future judgment. They just ignore all of that and say, no, that'll never happen. Well, they couldn't be more wrong. Verse 6, the psalmist talks more on God's exaltation. We've seen him talk about judgment. Now he's going to talk about exaltation. Verse 6, for not from the east, nor from the west, nor from the desert comes exaltation. Let me simplify this. This is like saying from no direction. We could add north, north and south, or we could say nor from the desert to the mountains. The point to be made here is that the only place that exaltation comes from is God. Nowhere else. God's the one who exalts. If you remember the story of Israel and the kings, God promoted their kings. He put their kings on the throne. They were the select ones from the family of David. After Saul, it was David, his family, his sons. That went on for a long time. So it's God who exalts. That's what you want to see here. What's exalt mean? To lift you up to a higher position. It can mean something like a promotion, maybe a rank, or someone says, okay, you're going to be a leader here. All right? Or maybe you're the lead person in a play. They say, because you're so good, we're going to exalt you. We're going to put you up there. You go, Wow. Be careful. Don't get arrogant. You'll be one of those boasters, huh? Okay, so God gives promotions. He exalt. Now, what this is telling us from what we've already seen with judgment, from nowhere does judgment or exaltation come except from God. God brings both. All right, he evaluates situations and people, and he can judge he can bring vengeance or he can bring exaltation and bless people. And let me say this and be real clear. The best way to be exalted is to let God do it. Now, what do you mean? What do I mean by that? Well, don't promote yourself. Okay? If a teacher or something like that or maybe you're in a club or on a team and they say, okay, you're going to be team captain. 
Well, all you did was work hard, and and the and the coach probably said, "Well, you're you're the the best player to do this." That's what he's thinking when he gives you that position. You're the best leader. Now, if you try to promote yourself, that can become a disaster, because now you got yourself in a position you might not be able to handle it, or it could. Uh, somehow make you think you're somebody you're not or better than you are and you're not because you just pushed yourself all right you'll see that a lot when you're especially a young person but believe me it happens to older people too you keep your priorities you keep following christ no matter what let him promote you at his time in his way in verses six through seven it is God, I should say seven now, it is God who brings exaltation. Then we'll see in verse eight that God also brings judgment. Now, we haven't got to that part yet, but I mentioned it. God also is the only one who really judges, that is, the important and final judgments. So we continue on with our, actually it's just one, still one sentence, all right? Let's go back to verse six again. I'll read that again and we'll continue. For not from the east, nor from the west, nor from the desert comes exaltation, but it is God who judges. He puts down one and exalts the other. You see, remember this, God is an all-knowing God. He knows everything. We call that uh, omniscience. He's also everywhere. We call that omnipresence. So he knows everything and he knows everywhere. So who would know better? Who would be the better judge? Who would be the better exalter? So he can evaluate people. He can evaluate situations and say, you're just right for this and promote you. Or say, oh, no, you don't want to do this. Let someone else do it. So God lets someone else do it, you see. And by the way, now this is a tough situation. This doesn't happen too often, but sometimes God will want to promote you, and you may not want him to. You know, sometimes I wonder if some of the kings thought that, boy, I wish I'd have never been king. Well, that could have happened. The Lord has his own purposes in promoting people. Sometimes he'll let evil people get on top, maybe so that nation can become, finish off its evil and God can have them disciplined or destroyed. And sometimes he'll bring a, being, a good person in to deliver, like Moses. Let God do the exalting. Don't exalt yourself. Verse 8 is interesting because it gets into using a cup of wine for judgment. Listen to this. For a cup is in the hand of the Lord, and the wine foams. It is well mixed, and he pours out from it. Surely all the wicked of the earth will drain it down to its dregs. Now here's the picture. Most all of you have probably seen a cup of wine. You know, if not, just think of a cup of water. But this is a cup of wine, probably purple, some color like that, in the Lord's hands. It's foamy. It has, a, it has a bubbles at the top. So that makes it appear fresh and like it just got poured. It's well mixed. That means in those days they put spices in it. Then he pours it out. He pours it out to the wicked. And they drink it all the way to the bottom, all right, like some sort of crazy drunk. He has to; ha he can't stop from drinking. Well, the evil people are the drunks. They're the ones that get the wine. This is God's judgment. He pours it out on them. They are judged by remember that perfectly fair judgment of the Lord. So the idea is the more they drink, the more they become unsteady, what they call intoxicated. They can't stand up straight. They can't walk straight. They slur their words. They sway. This all pictures judgment. They're being judged and they're about to fall over. That's the judgment. Listen to Psalm 60, verse 3. I'll put it on the board. You have made your people experience hardship. 
You have given us wine to drink that makes us stagger. This is a way of saying you've been getting discipline. Now, if you study the last psalm with me, you're familiar with Judah going into captivity with Babylon. Babylon held them as prisoners. Listen to what Isaiah wrote. Now, here's the situation. Judah, what's left of Israel, has been taken captive. Now, the warning is you people need to wake up. Get back right with the Lord. Read this with me. Isaiah 51, 17. Wake yourself, wake yourself. Stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. See, that describes what we're studying, doesn't it? You see, they had disobeyed the Lord, the Lord disciplined by bringing Babylon, an evil nation, on them. He used evil people to discipline his people. Sometimes God does that. Well, Isaiah goes on, There was none to guide her among all the sons she has borne. There was none to take her by the hand among all the sons she has brought up. They don't have a good leader now. These two things have happened to you. Who will console you? Who will com comfort you? That's what that means. Devastation and destruction, famine and sword. Who will comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They can't even fight. Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street. That means they're probably dead. They've fallen and they're dead. Like an antelope in a net. They are full of the wrath, of the wrath of the Lord. The rebuke of your God. That's part of their discipline. Many people died. Therefore hear this, you who are afflicted, who are drunk, but not with wine. It's drunk with judgments, my understanding. Thus says your Lord, the God, your Lord, the Lord, your God who pleads the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath. You shall drink no more. You see, now... Judah's at the point where they're going to turn around back to the Lord. The bowl of my wrath you shall drink no more. Verse 23. And I will put it in the hand of your tormentors. Uh-oh. What does that mean? Now it's Babylon's turn. It's their set time to be disciplined and punished. And I will put it into the hand of your tormentors who have said to you, bow down that we may pass over and you have and you have made your back like the ground, and you like the street for them to pass over. So the Babylonians had been telling them this, but that's all going to change. They've been telling the Judah, Jews from Judah, to lie down. We're going to walk all over you. That's changed. Things are starting to turn around. All right? So now we understand what this whole thing about wine and judgment is. We finally come to the last section, section three, where we're going to have the psalmist declares forever praising God who cuts off the wicked and lifts up the righteous. That's verses nine and 10. Verse nine, but I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob he says the same thing in two different ways here. I will declare it. That refers to the wondrous works, the fact that God judges, that he exalts all the things he's talked about, his deliverances, his, his constant care over his people. Now, in this psalm, it has to do with judgment primarily and exaltation. But we also saw the wondrous works. So he continues to do it. He says, in a way, he's saying, I commit to doing this even says it again, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. Well, the God of Jacob is another name for the God of Israel, our God, um, the God we worship, the God who sent his son, Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is, he's going to keep on doing this. He's going to tell people about what God has done for them, for his people, for himself. He's not afraid to talk about it. You see the word it here, that takes on all the things that he's been talking about. That's what he's going to tell people. Let me tell you the story when God delivered us from this or saved us from that 
or he healed me from that, or he guided me this direction. He helped me avoid this evil. See, there's all kinds of things he could talk about. And he says, I will commit. That's what he's saying. I'll continue to do it. I will sing praises. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to talk about God. And then the conclusion, God speaks. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. Now we know what horns are now, don't we? That's their strength. That's their might. It may mean military strength. So the confidence of the psalmist comes out here and he expresses what God says. God will cut off the wicked. That's like cutting off their horns, their power, their control. Even their loud mouths will stop. And in contrast, notice the but, the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. We've talked about exaltation, lifting up. That's what this is. The power and the strength of the righteous believers, the saints, the Old Testament saints in that day, in our day, we can say God will lift us up too. It's the righteous who are exalted, who God lifts up. If he choose to promote you on this earth, and certainly in eternity, when you're with him as his faithful servant, you will spend eternity dwelling with the almighty, sovereign creator of heavens and earth, our God and our Savior. What a way to end it. Well, let's really end it by reading Psalm 75. Verse 1, actually verse 0. To the director of music, according to Do Not Destroy, a psalm of Asaph, a song. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous works. When I appoint a set time, I will judge fairly. When the earth and all inhabit it are unsteady, it is I who keep steady its pillars. Selah. I said to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high or speak with haughty neck. For not from the east nor from the west nor from the desert comes exaltation, but it is God who judges. He puts down one and exalts another. For a cup is in the hand of the Lord and the wine foams. It is well mixed and he pours out from it. Surely all the wicked of the earth will drain it down to its dregs. But I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. Let's pray. Father and God, we thank you for another wonderful psalm. We thank you that we clearly have been told that you are the judge and you judge at your time, that you are the one who exalts and you will exalt your righteous people. So, Father, help us be submissive to you to learn the things that we've heard today and that we might properly apply them in the power of your Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.